Welcome everyone, I am Adde Shewa Josh, and this is a special episode of Africa Matters. This week, we take a health check on the African continent and ask whether it's on track to reach the United Nations Universal Health Benchmarks by 2030. And we look at what's behind the latest measles outbreak in Zimbabwe and what the government is doing to contain it. We'll also feature a Nigerian musician who is setting the record straight on sickle cell disease by spreading awareness and helping those battling the blood disorder. The latest report by the World Health Organization shows that, on average, Africans have an average life expectancy of 56 years, which is up from 46 at the turn of the century. But it's below the global average of 64. The WHO says Africans are now living longer because of improvements in public health services, maternal and child care, as well as progress in the fight against infectious diseases. Let's take a look at what's being done so far to improve the state of health in the continent. Last year, the World Health Organization approved the usage of Muscarix, the world's first malaria vaccine in children. An Ebola vaccine was licensed in 2020 and COVID-19 vaccines manufacture has begun in the continent. A recent report by AMREF Health Africa shows less than half of Africa's population have access to the health care they need. The report also says only seven countries in Africa fund more than 50 percent of their national health budgets. The WHO says nearly 100 million Africans spend at least 10 percent of their income on health expenditures every year. It adds that over the past 20 years, out-of-pocket health expenditure has either stagnated or increased and that at least 15 million Africans risk being impoverished every year because of unaffordable health care. Let's hear more from Dr. Amitaka. He's the chair, Africa Healthcare Federation. He joins me from Nairobi. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to Africa Matters. What's your assessment of Africa's healthcare system in the last two decades and after the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you for having me. My assessment on the two decades is Africa is on the right, the health sector. I would use one word after the pandemic, it's called bounce back. So building back better has another B in it called bounce back. So it's ready to bounce back. We've understood where the weaknesses were. We understood where the gaps were. We understood more about partnership. And when it dawned on to us during the lockdown, when people couldn't travel outside Africa for treatment, like they did, including heads of state, we're now getting back to the pieces and building the pieces on the systems where there were weakness. Tertiary, specialized care, more skills, more investments. Um, uh, you know, in the recently concluded United Nations General Assembly, uh, the amount that was stated that would be worth the healthcare business in Africa is $259 billion. Mm. Uh, we will just be second to United States when it comes to the share of healthcare business in the next decade. Now, talking about so, money. I say to right. 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 Go on. Go on. Before I... You can go on. Yeah, no. I think we're set to rise. Right. The opportunities are great in digital health, in pharmaceutical manufacturing, in uh, e-learning and healthcare academia, uh, and low-cost, high-quality health services. These are just some that I have to mention. Right. I want to take you up on that low cost and high quality health care. It is true that Africans are now living longer, uh, but they can't. Many people still cannot afford basic health care. How can we make health care become more accessible and affordable to not just a few, to everyone? Absolutely. In fact, you've touched on the two biggest barriers we deal with in Africa, financial barrier and geographical barrier. And I think there is going to be a mix between digital health as a solution and making sure that our GDP continues rising. Mm -hmm. Look, as far as the geographical barriers concerned, I think digital health has a promise. Just like we had electronic money platforms in m -Pesa, we need to bring telehealth mm -hmm. that will traverse many kilometers across so that people can access qualified health services. 
the digital platform. But there's one thing we have to work slowly and build step by step, and that is increasing our GDP and allocation to healthcare's budgets across Africa. And that's a brilliant exactly. that's a brilliant point you've just made because only seven African governments are investing on health systems uh, the way right. they should. Why isn't healthcare seen as a priority in many African countries? I think people also consider healthcare as a social sector. And many ministers of health look at healthcare as a sector that they invest in, but they don't see immediate return that come out of it. So obviously. They are all the time thinking on what best other sectors they can invest in. So I really want to uh, urge that health does create wealth. It's not always that it's wealth creating health. When you invest in health, you'll have productive uh, workforce that will help your economy grow. That hasn't been packaged well for the ministers of finance in Africa. Before I ask you the last question, I want you to address the issue of brain drain that we are experiencing uh, in Africa. If we have some of our best hands and minds and brains jetting out of the continent for reasons absolutely justifiable to each uh, and every person who's been leaving, how do we make up for that um, in the next decade? Well, it's a journey for us, to be honest. Everyone, all of us who are in Africa, we have to change the brain drain into the brain gain. How? We have to make the diaspora understand that coming back to Africa is not only economically viable mm -hmm. from what they might be earning in those countries, but also socially impactful. So there's a double bottom line with the people who live outside Africa. Come back, the environment is better, the public-private partnership dialogue is better, the conditions are better, and we would like to welcome the knowledge that you've gained in other countries to come in, back in Africa. So I think there is a huge amount of Africans who will get more satisfied in giving back when Africa is on the rise. Well, let's hope that soon. So vaccine access and delivery was a thorny issue during the pandemic. How is it now? Uh, and has the continent managed to fill that gap so that it doesn't find itself in the same position ever again? Are you talking about specifically vaccines or access of general health commodities? I'm talking specifically about vaccines. Ah, uh, yeah. Look, it's, it's still a thorny issue, to be mm. honest. We are the last in the queue. We'll remain last in the queue. We'll always have to try and stamp that Africa needs it, even monkeypox. Forget even COVID. You saw what happened with monkeypox. We're among the last in the queue. What has dawned on to us is we must spend a little bit more on R&D mm. and set up some manufacturing hub. And you've seen the heads of state and countries that have already started the process. We need to set up our units in Africa, for Africa, so that Africa is not left behind in the queue. So it's still a thorny issue. Dr. Amit Taka, Chair Africa Healthcare Federation, always a pleasure to have you on the program. See you for now. Bye. We go to Zimbabwe now, where more than 700 children have died over the past five months due to a measles outbreak. Despite the government's best efforts, UNICEF says many children are still at risk because of misconceptions around vaccinations in certain communities. Last month, government figures showed more than 6,000 suspected cases of measles had been reported since April. In response, the Southern African government, UNICEF and other partners have intensified efforts to get children immunized. Cordela Masalituni has more. Born and raised in a conservative religious community in Manikalan province, Samuel Shuva was never immunized as a child. He says his family was suspicious of vaccinations, and as a result, when measles hit his family in August, he and his children almost died. I was so distraught, asking God what on earth was happening. How could it be the whole family? The little boy there especially was so very sick. He was bleeding through the nose and the mouth and his breath was stinking. The first case was reported in April in the district where Samuel was born and it spread across the country. 
more than 6,000 people have contracted measles in Zimbabwe since. This clinic is the clinic where doctors and nurses worked frantically to save Samuel and his children's lives. It was a close call. But officials say that most measles cases are preventable because Zimbabwe has an immunization program in place targeting more than 6 million children between the ages of 6 months and 15 years of age. The measles vaccine is usually administered six months after birth. However, a rise in vaccine hesitancy has meant that many children are not taken to get their shots. Disinformation about the safety and necessity of these preventative measures has been one major factor in the spread of measles, especially in conservative areas, analysts say. Officials hope to change this trend by engaging with local leaders and affected communities. The government also reached out to those religious leaders who do not believe in vaccination and the public awareness to the country to make sure no child should die of measles. The government says it aims to ensure that similar levels of success are recorded across the country in the weeks and months ahead. In the meantime, Samuel and his children say they are grateful to have survived measles and are hopeful the outbreak will be contained. Cordelia Masale Turini. Africa Matters, Chiota, Zimbabwe. We go to Uganda next, which is struggling to contain an Ebola outbreak caused by the Sudan virus, which currently has no effective treatment or vaccine. Even though another strain, the Zaire Ebola virus has been responsible for more outbreaks and human cases of the disease, there is growing concern that it could spread even more, as Darren Alan Cheyune reports. Alex Sevaiga has endured a tough fortnight after being diagnosed with a deadly Ebola disease. But he's counting his blessings because five days ago, he was discharged from hospital. His aunt and her child, who he caught the disease from, weren't so lucky. Both have died. I had a fever, the head and back were hurting and my bones were in pain too. I rushed for treatment so I never got the major signs like vomiting or diarrhea. The doctors quickly helped me but my other colleagues I went with got those major signs and even those that I had helped suffered with them. About five of them died while I was watching. The region is now on high alert over the rare Sudan strain of the Ebola virus. The death rate is much higher than the other more common Zaire variant as there is no effective treatment of vaccine. The Ebola virus has brought misery for families in this area. Two days ago, a victim was buried here, but now the surviving relatives are facing stigma from other residents. The Mwende Hospital is currently at the center of the outbreak and there is restricted access to patients who have been put under isolation. Its capacity has been boosted with manpower and equipment like this mobile laboratory set up to quicken results of blood and other fluid samples by at least two hours. The, the whole response is quite now well organized, has taken a shot. And at the hospital we are mainly concentrating on, uh, on uh, caring for the sick and protecting the health workers as well as participating in other pillars of care. They also participate in the surveillance, we also participate in the laboratory services, and also participate in, the, in, the, in the contact tracing. Sebaiga and other recovered patients are still monitored for 21 days after being released from hospital. Health response teams are also providing communities with thermometers and collecting data for contact tracing. Frontline health workers are, however, at a risk. We lost over 64 health workers during COVID-19. They were never compensated. As we talk right now, there's no compensation plan set up yet by Minister of Health to guide Minister of Gender and Minister of Finance into the allocation of these resources for the families. And right now, we are heading into another deadly catastrophic disease. And as we know, it has a high mortality. Uganda's government says it requires $18 million to contain this deadly virus with the help of the WHO. Uganda has previously succeeded in its fight against Ebola, but with an economy battered by COVID-19, this could be the country's biggest battle yet. Darren Alan Cheyune, Africa Matters, Mubende, Central Uganda. While measles and Ebola grab headlines and emergency funding, 
There's another disease that gets relatively little attention despite being highly prevalent across Africa. Sickle cell disease is a hereditary disorder that affects red blood cells, and it's more common in Nigeria than anywhere else in the world. The World Health Organization estimates that the country makes up more than half of the 300,000 babies born with the condition globally every year. But awareness about the disease is hampered by myths and misinformation. Now, one sickle cell fighter is using music to set the record straight, as Timothy Obiezo reports from Abuja. Nigerian musician Toyin Praiseworth has been living with sickle cell disease for 28 years. As a teenager, he had his first crisis and feared for his life. But now, he's putting his experiences into his music and helping many others like him live through the challenge. I realized that the disease is still rampant, it's still replicable. There's still a lot of ignorance in our society. So I knew that I had to do something about it. And I'm a musician, that's my area of competence. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder that causes the blood to break down an estimated 150,000 babies are born in Nigeria with the condition every year and up to 80% of them die before the age of five. Health experts say the lack of mandatory screening for all newborn babies and few testing kits that could reduce premature deaths are to blame. Number one, keep malaria out of To help spread the word, Praiseworth makes weekly posts and jingles for listeners on social media. And last year, he launched a non-profit called The Sickle Sound, using music to debunk myths and tackle misinformation associated with the condition in Nigeria. The feedback I'm getting is that you just said what the words are in our hearts. So the song tells the story of every sickle cell warrior. It's a song that is of comfort, a song of strength. You want to go to schools, to talk to young children, to talk to adolescents, to talk to parents, because a lot of parents don't even know how to handle their children that are sickle cell warriors. Ena Ochibo lost two siblings to the disease and is now trying to help prevent more deaths. Her nonprofit organizes free genotype testing in communities and hosts periodic hangouts for sickle cell warriors to discuss common challenges. I felt like it was a way to reach out to people. I lost two siblings to sickle cell anemia and it was too much for me to handle at the time and I kind of felt like if I do, if I do something different from the um, usual or what I'm used to, it was going to bring some sort of fulfillment. Until I decided to go for a hangout and then I realized, oh, there are other people like me, there are other people that are out there. I was just thinking I was the only one. The World Health Organization says 25% of Nigeria's population are carriers of the mutant genes that give rise to sickle cell. Last year, lawmakers passed a bill to prevent marriage among such people, but without adequate investment in awareness and community genotype testing, the problem is only likely to persist. Timothy Obiezu, Africa Matters, Abuja, Nigeria. Welcome back. You're watching Africa Matters with me, Adeshewa Josh. We go to Cameroon now, where a new app is revolutionizing communication between health workers and patients. It makes it easier for nurses to monitor patients and improve their response times and workflows. From Douala, Arison Tampa reports this new app is saving time and stress in hospitals. This small device could save lives in hospitals. Patients using an app called Tell Me are able to alert a doctor or nurse to quickly attend to them while in hospital. Biomedical engineer Fabrice Tueche developed the app to improve patient care workers. When the patient has a problem, he just needs to press on this button. And once he, he press this button, the nurse will receive on his own watch the the a patient who press the button, the button with the uh, number of his room. It also collects data to see staff's response times and workflows. A prototype of Tell Me Up was successfully tested in this hospital earlier this year. Fabrice and his team hope to produce more than half a million hardware devices that are linked to the app that could save lives beyond Cameroon. Doctors say it's particularly good for patients with chronic illnesses 
that need medical attention all the time. It really saves lives because when there's an emergency, the patient may be convulsing. And for him to find a staff member who is in another section of the hospital, he will no longer have to run. There's an alert here and it has a wide range of reach. If you ring here, for example, maybe I'm shopping, I will quickly come back. So that's a big change. Alliance Bikai is one of many Cameroonians using the Tell Me app to assess quick medical care in hospital. Before, patients were worried that nurses were not really following them up because in other hospitals you have to move to call a nurse. But now the new technology really brings the very great innovations, so I think it's good. Fabrice has partnered with a French company to produce more hardware devices but limited internet connection and steady power supply in hospitals is proving to be a huge challenge. Fabrice and his team hope that Tell Me Up can significantly improve health care in Cameroon and beyond. Aris in Tanfu, Africa Matters, Douala, Cameroon. Moving on from tech health solutions, we head to the United Kingdom next. Over the last year, more than 10,000 Nigerian health workers have left the country in search of better opportunities. They blame poor welfare and working conditions for going abroad. Lakbe Olarinoye talks to some of them who've set up base in London. This is Dr. Kainde, and he is one of the thousands of Nigerian trained doctors who have migrated to the UK to work in the country's medical system. Shortly before I left Nigeria, I was a registrar in trauma orthopedics at um, Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital in Edo State. And um, I was in my third year of training before I decided to move down to the UK. Ten years ago, junior doctors in Nigeria earned around $1,000 a month. But since then, the currency has suffered a severe devaluation and now many doctors take home half of that, only $500 a month. So there's now a mass exodus of health personnel leaving Nigeria and leaving the country's health system in a bad shape. I got tired of the system, sincerely. I got tired of having to go back and forth on strikes. Got tired of government promising to improve healthcare delivery in the country and remunerations were poor and salaries that were take home could, not, could no longer take us home. It isn't just money that is driving the health migration. Many are after international medical experience as well as what they describe as a better life. The UK is no stranger to migrant medical staff. This pattern has occurred for several decades. In the 1950s, nurses from the Caribbean were given incentives to come to work in Britain. Alamade, a nurse from Nigeria, decided to take a similar leap five months ago. I believe that the training we get in Nigeria is superb. And um, basically, when you come into the UK, you're just trying to learn the new policies, the policies of your trust, the policies of your workplace, how they do things, and just basically the equipment they use. The mass migration of nurses, as you said, from the continent of Africa, from Nigeria, Ghana, Zimbabwe. Um, we have, uh, in the few months I've been practicing in the UK, I've met nurses from all over the world. The Nigerian Medical Council estimates that over 9,000 of its doctors have left to work in hospitals across Europe. But it's not just Nigerian trained doctors making the swap. This economic migration spans across the entire medical field. This year alone, the UK Home Office recorded an increase of 29,000 visa applications between 2021 and 2022. The mass migration of health professionals is happening across Africa, with the UK being a hotspot for this type of recruitment. And with more medical professionals queuing to leave Nigeria and the continent, the future of medical care still looks bleak. Lape Alarinoye, Africa Matters. And finally this week, we explore Malange in north-central Angola. The city is known for its diverse natural beauty, including the Kalandula waterfalls, which are the second largest on the continent by volume after Victoria Falls. Let's take a closer look.
that's our show for this week. Please share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshewa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment and share. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next week.